coming up on the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. We're going to talk about six ways you can lessen stress to the plants in your garden. As well as what to do with all that extra zucchini, some secrets in preserving and cooking it. We're going to have radio show host, author, and horticultural expert, Jessica Walliser. As well as your garden questions and our garden answers. Garden Radio is on the airwaves, and it all starts right now. You are tuned in to the only vegetable gardening radio show in Milwaukee with your host, Joey Baird, who grew up in the country but now lives closer to the city, and Holly Baird, who has always been a city girl. Combined, they have over 25 years of gardening experience who believe in simple gardening practices. A gardener for all gardeners, founders of the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com, where they created over 800 how-to garden videos to teach others how to grow more of what they eat. Join them for the next hour as they discuss vegetable gardening and more. It is the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show on 860 AM WNOV and W293CX 106.5. Wherever you may be listening, however you may be listening, whether on those particular stations, the TuneIn app, the Simple Radio app, the uh, uh, Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show, uh, ra- radio tab on the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com website, or anywhere in between, we are happy to have you along. We are live in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I am your host. Besides me is my wife, co-host, best friend, gardening partner. Hi, Baird. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener. Dot com is your destination for over 965 garden-related videos, digital magazines, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and a whole lot more. And if you want to contact us and you've got a question for us, you can do that. But we have great companies that allow us to be here each and every Saturday morning, just like... Nasala Kombucha is the executive sponsor of the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show. Nasala is Veda, Wisconsin, with local tea and natural herbs. Look for it in the refrigerator aisle at your local grocer. If you don't see it, ask for it. Because if it's not Nasala Kombucha, it's not kombucha. You can find out more at nasala.com. You can contact us in a variety of ways. You can email us at twvgradio at gmail.com anytime with your garden questions. If you have a problem, we can ask you to attach a photograph of it so we can better identify that and get you the correct information. Same thing with hashtag TWVG on Twitter. Or during the show, you can call into the IVOrganics.com hotline. Ivy Organic 301 Plant Guard naturally protects plants against damaging sunburn, insects, and rodents, protects newly installed plants and trees, shields pruned and damaged surfaces for use on your roses, fruit and nut trees, ornamental trees, and shrubs. This product is non-toxic, environmentally safe, and organic. For more information, you can visit IVOrganics.com. You can call into the Ivy Organic hotline anytime during the show at 414-444-5250. And uh, you can do that, and we'll be happy to get you the information that you need to make your garden better. Well, it's uh, I, I want to give credit where credit is due here before we get too far into the show. A lot of things have happened over the last year in order to make this show possible. Many hours have put in. i got to give credit where credit is due, and Holly has been a uh, good part of that. Uh, many of you who are listening, you may be with somebody or married to somebody who doesn't partake in the activities in which you enjoy. Holly likes doing the gardening. She likes being on the radio. And uh, I could do this all myself, but you enjoy being there and, and being part of it, and I appreciate that. And uh, well, You're welcome. Yeah. And, and it's pretty cool when people say, what do you do? Well, I have a radio show. Mm-hmm. People who don't even care about gardening will listen when you tell them, hey, I have a radio show. Yeah, because they're nosy. Yeah, and, and they like that. <laughs> but that's okay, because I'm nosy too. Yeah. So, so uh, with that being said, I mean, you know, we're working diligently to get uh, on the air next year. Uh, I'm not going to get any business details, but Holly and I acquire the sponsors that make this show possible, so it, we have control over it, and, and we do a lot of work to uh, find companies that match what we we believe in when it comes to gardening and uh, canning and all of that stuff that goes along with it. So we're going to get into, uh, we've had rain about every three hours now. You no. didn't mention that I was a sailboat trailer expert. Oh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> sailboat. We were going and we uh, coming here and there was this trailer and I didn't know what it was and Holly said, oh, that's a sailboat trailer, which I didn't know that you <laughs> had any knowledge of sailboat expertise whatsoever. Well, I've grown up by water my whole life, okay. so well, I know things. Well, I know tractors, so mm-hmm. there you go. Okay. So let's get into six ways in which you can lessen the stress on your garden. We're getting rain every three to five hours now, uh, middle of July. August is typically one of the hotter months here and uh, leading into early September. So in order to lessen the stress on your garden, that's going to increase the productivity and make your plants happier and make you happier because you're getting more out of your garden. Now, 
when I talk about less than the stress, I'm talking about when the temperature was 75 or 80 degrees yesterday, and today it's now 93 to 105 type of thing. The, the fluctuation, that increase of temperature and humidity is a shock to a lot of plants. So by doing these six steps, that will decrease some of that stress on those plants and make them grow better, more productivity. So so I think the number one thing here is to consistently water and it's when you water. And that's important because if you water during the midday, that's not going to be as effective as in the morning. Right. And, and I know and I know we have jobs and we, we can't all uh, access the uh, water that we need to water the plants at the time. So what we can, you know, timers, irrigation, that type of thing. But the reason why you want to choose the morning is because the plants have had all night to relax and they are stress-free. So you water in the morning, the plants are able to uptake the, the water that is needed, and then it can prepare for those hot days. If you water in the afternoon, it, 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 top water, bottom water, or whatever, it's not that the water is going to get on the plants' leaves and burn the plants' leaves. We've ex- dis- de- debunked that. That has nothing to do with it. What happens is the evaporation of the above-ground sprinkler system or the water that gets on the soil, it will compete with the plant because the evaporation of the heat, the plant's trying to suck the water in, the plant's stressed, it needs the water, it, it really hurts the plant. And also when these day temperatures get extremely high, a lot of your plants will stop production. Peppers and tomato flowering will stop, uh, and, and some of these cool weather crops such as lettuce will bolt because of the heat. It's the longevity of the day uh, has a little bit to do with it, but the heat will put that plant in a reproductive state, which when I mean bolt... It's, it puts on a central stalk and begins to flower in like 24 to 48 hours, and those flowers will turn into seed. And the leaves are very bitter, and you can't eat them anymore. So by watering in the morning, that will enable the plant to be hydrated properly for the day to come with the heat. Right. Another one is? It would be density planting, and as planting close together, leaves create shade over the soil and keeps the soil cool. So it might be too late for that. But if you're planting for the fall, that's something you could do because we never really know what kind of fall we're going to get. It can um, be a long one or it can be a short one. <laughs> right. So uh, We've could, been done you, in the middle of October before, and last year we ran to almost the week of Thanksgiving. Right. So you have to keep that in mind. Now you don't have to worry about the heat as much, but you're, if you do have a nice soil cover, that's going to give you some, some less weeds. Right. It prevents the sun from exposing the, the, the soil with the sunlight. It reduces the evaporation because it's basically an umbrella over that uh, soil. And less sun, weeds kind of need sunlight to germinate and grow. And if you shade those out, that's really going to reduce the amount of weeds that you have in your garden. Densely plant, and I'll briefly go over this. Let's say the back of the seed packet says you plant a row, uh, you, ro- you plant kale every, and, I, and this is not true. I'm just putting these numbers out so it, it, we can all have a visual uh, image of this a plant every 12 inches, and then a row every 18 inches so you can walk through. Densely plant would mean you plant your kale plants every 8 inches and put your row, instead of 18 inches apart, about 12 inches apart. So it has this just shrubbery of plants so the ground is covered. That's what densely planting means, and that can be for any variety of plants. Uh, uh, Things you want to not densely plant, uh, tomatoes would be one of them because the diseases can jump from plant to plant very easily uh, would be your most don't do, but we've already planted our tomatoes, so we don't have to worry about that. I think squash. Squash, uh, it it can be good and can be bad because of the powdery mildew that can form on it, which we will discuss next week on the program. Another one is let's not fertilize when it's super hot. Uh, Fertilization is something we encourage because maybe our soil is not as fertile as it could be. Now, this can be granular fertilizer, liquid fertilizer, synthetic organic compost teas, but you don't want to do it when it's about 82, 83 degrees or higher. The reason why is the plants in those temperatures that exceed, I'm I'm saying 82 because the buffer is about 85 and above, when these plants get in a very heat-stricken situation, they want to shut down. Just like you, if you're working and it's 105 degrees, 90% humidity, you kind of want to do minimal amount of work. You might have to do something, but the plants also want to shut down. And also, you'll see the leaves get really wilty. That's just a defense mechanism they have. It's just like a solar panel. 
if a solar panel has rounded edges, it's not going to absorb as much sunlight. The same thing is true with these plants. Corn, uh, tomatoes, beans, squashes will all get real limp like they're really lacking water, but that's just the way they per- prevent themselves from getting burnt up. That makes sense. By fertilizing them, you're telling that plant, I know you're stressed, or I know it's hot, but I need you to keep working. So it's going to overstress that plant and actually hurt it in the long run. So wait until the temperatures, if you do need to fertilize, wait until the temperatures are cooler below 80 to 82 degrees Fahrenheit before you decide to feed those plants, whether a foliage feed sprayed on the leaves or liquid or granular feed for the roots. What's another one we want to avoid? Harvesting before a heat wave. Harvesting before the heat wave, you want to do that, let's say, for example, tomorrow it's supposed to be, and it's not, but let's say tomorrow is supposed to be extremely hot, let's say 93, 95. If you can go in there and harvest your crops today, that's going to reduce a tremendous amount of stress on your plants because a plant will take three to four times more energy to keep a tomato or a zucchini or a pepper healthy, the fruit, on the plant. If you can remove that prior to a heat wave, you're going to uh, reduce a three to four time percent energy, uh, ex- ex- you know, energy put out towards protecting that fruit and keeping it on the plant because the plant doesn't care if you're eating its tomatoes or its peppers or its green beans. It's looking at creating seeds to carry on the genetics for the next generation, just the way nature has planned it and made it work. So it doesn't care. It, it's trying to keep those seeds viable, uh, healthy, and then at a certain point it would drop the fruit if we didn't pick it, and it would have those seeds go to dormancy until next spring. So we don't want to fertilize. Harvest. Uh, our har- we don't, we, we don't want to harvest when it's hot. We want to harvest before the heat comes, and that will uh, make it much easier on the plants and you. Because uh, you don't want to be harvesting when it's hot outside, and you probably would avoid that. And then your zucchini, if you've ever grown zucchini, your 8-inch zucchini has now become the size of a baseball bat in about 14 hours. And uh, we're going to cover uh, what you can do with that when you have that excessive size zucchini uh, in the next segment. Another thing, we want to uh, talk about sh- uh, well, shade cloth first. Okay. What is shade cloth? Shade cloth is... It's a cloth. It's got like little holes in it. Basically, it's a fabric. It's a fabric. It's thin, and it it you can buy it at most garden centers, and it helps give your garden shade, but it still allows sunlight to come through. There is twenty percent shade cloth, thirty, forty, fifty. That re, that's the amount of sunlight it reduces the plants uh, getting on it. Now, why would you want to keep your plants from getting sunlight? Well, if you if you're in a high sun area, um, maybe you you have a very open area, and you get a lot of intense sun yes you want that intense sun but during the peak of the summer right now that could be problematic uh also if you're trying to get lettuce to grow in the uh, lettuce is heat sensitive and daylight sensitive so you can put that shade cloth over let's say 50 percent shade cloth over top of that area where the lettuce is now that lettuce is thinking that you can kind of trick your lettuce trick your lettuce it's reduction of sunlight by 50 percent which means the intensity is down 50 percent which means heat is down by a significant amount and that's going to prolong the life of some of these cool weather crops so it's not a mandatory thing Um, a lot of people don't do it but you can create a shade cloth tent or hoop and it will do very well we've never experienced we've never played around with it but it's something that you can look into if you're really wanting to be, you know, in, into this thing right, about definitely. reducing the stress. And finally... So mulch, mulch. Mulch and mulch. And mulch is great for many reasons. One is it suppresses weeds. It helps keep the moisture in your soil. Um, but then it also can decrease the soil temps by 3 to 5 degrees. Which is tremendous when it's in the middle of the summer and your soil temperature is in that borderline where, you know, let's say a 75, 80 degrees, you knock that down 5 degrees, you're back down to 7, you're back in a, a root zone control, uh, temperature zone for the roots that the, the plants are, are happy with, that they like. Uh, mulch can be anything from chemical-free, seed-free grass clippings to, well, we don't have leaves, you can use straw, uh, you can use shredded paper, it's not the most eye-appealing, but it does work. Uh, I think you have the best access to probably straw at this point. And grass and, clippings. Well, and grass clippings. That hasn't been weed and feed uh, and chemically we'll treated. And dry yeah. grass clippings. Yeah. But, yeah, definitely something to consider, especially starting this fall. Think about if you want to start mulching your garden next year, think about um, collecting those leaves. And wood chips, I would only recommend using wood chips in an area that is a perennial bed, such as maybe rhubarb or potentially strawberries or uh, asparagus, things like that, because wood chips will break down. They will rob the soil of nitrogen. 
and then you've got a whole other issue on your hands. Now, if you're doing a Back to Eden Garden thing, that's a whole other separate topic that we can cover at a later date. Well, when we come back, do you have a lot of zucchini? Have you had a lot of zucchini? Are you tired of people giving you a lot of zucchini in the past? Well, we're going to cover a whole di- uh, a number of different ways in which you can use zucchini in canning, preserving, and cooking right after this. Have a gardening question? Email Joey and Holly at twvgradio at gmail.com. Do you have a little space to grow? Check out Greenstock Vertical Gardens at greenstockgarden.com. Greenstock is engineered to grow with its innovative space and water-saving design. You can grow vegetables, flowers, herbs, and even strawberries in just two square feet of space. Grow up instead of out. Perfect for the porch, patio, or deck. Grow up to 30 plants in a small space. Greenstockgarden.com has everything you need to grow in the littlest of spaces. Proudly made in the USA. For more information and to purchase, visit greenstockgarden.com. Beans and Barley Marketing Cafe, a neighborhood specialty grocery store for the east side of the greater Milwaukee area, where you can find all you need from fresh produce to bakery to organic frozen dinners, from wine to fresh squeezed carrot juice. A health food store with hundreds of products, vitamin supplements, bath and body items, magazines, cars, books, and a knowledgeable staff. Catering available. Open daily at 8 a.m. The restaurant serves breakfast, lunch, and dinner seven days a week with a menu of good, healthy, homemade food, including vegetarian and non-vegetarian specialties. 1901 East North Avenue, Milwaukee, 414 and online at beansandbarley.com. The River West Co-op Grocery and Cafe is proud to support the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener and a lot of other Wisconsin growers as well. The co Co-op offers a wide range of local and organic produce in their store and on their cafe menu, from apples to yogurt and everything in between. Open 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. weekdays, 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. weekends at the corner of Clark and Frackney in Milwaukee's River West neighborhood. See what is in store and check out the Co-op Cafe's delicious vegetarian menu at riverwestcoop.org. Hi, I'm John Lewandowski, retail manager of Blue Mel's Garden and Land. Center. Now, I'm not going to tell you about our awesome dome-grown plants, our beautiful pottery, or our 40 varieties of landscape materials. What I am going to tell you is that Blue Mills is a local, independent, family-owned garden center that truly cares about your garden or landscape project. So if you're looking for that one garden center that actually cares about you, come to Blue Mills Garden and Landscape Center. We've been treating our customers like family since 1955. Blue Mills, 4930 West Loomis Road, 414-282-4220. Now back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden Radio Show with your hosts, Joey and Holly Baird. Uh, the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show is on the air on WNOV 860 AM and W293CX 106.5, live in Milwaukee. So happy you've joined us today. The WisconsinVegetableGardener.com is your destination for all things gardening. Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and uh, 965 plus videos and a whole lot more. Well, we went to and got our peaches uh, a week ago this past Wednesday. I did from TreeRipe.com up in the Cedarburg area. They they have multiple stops in the area. We got them canned, and uh, we're going to make a pie out of what's left over. We got uh, seven quarts uh, of pear, uh, peaches, as well as eight, uh, eight. Yeah. and one one's a refrigerator. Uh, mm-hmm. Uh, canned, as well as the leftover we're going to make pie out of. Now, they just don't have peaches. They have blueberries and pecans, and yes. they are just everywhere you look, they're they're parked and they're selling the peaches at farmer's markets as well as out of the back of the truck. Yeah, so they sell at farmer's markets. They s- sell smaller quantities there. Yeah, if you don't want and a half a bushel. Uh, yeah, you otherwise, don't. the back of the truck, you can get half a bushel of peaches. I think it's five pounds of blueberries and a couple pounds of Pecans. Uh, shelled pecans. Yeah, okay. yeah, you don't have to worry about hacking these things open with a hammer. They're already right. ready to go. So they do have some options, and in the winter, usually in January or so, they have citrus. So that's something to keep in mind, you know, some fresh Florida citrus. But you can find out more at tree-ripe.com. They have locations all over, including not just Wisconsin, but Iowa, Upper and Lower Michigan, Minnesota, Illinois. So you can find out their schedule They'll be, I think they go kind of through August. I don't know how they do the farmer's markets, but definitely something to check out. Um, it's just really good produce. Yeah, we, we tell you it's, it's great produce and there's not a mealy peach. And, you know, we could talk about them for 20 minutes, but it's one of these things you have to experience the quality 
of it. Uh, they've got quantity, but they also have quantity, uh, quality of the peaches, too. They, they don't pack bad peaches or questionable ones. If it's not good, they don't put it in the box, and they don't sell it to you. Uh, tree-ripe.com. Well, uh, in past years, if you've uh, known somebody who's gardened or you've gardened yourself, uh, you probably have planted too much zucchini or you thought, oh, I need more, and you've planted way too much. And uh, people give you zucchini and, you know, people who you thought you loved and loved you, and they just keep giving you more zucchini. <laughs> so we're going to go over several ways in which you can, you can just hide it, you know, on their front Porch, Porch, yeah, you lock your car because people set bags of zucchini inside. That was the old joke down where I'm from. People would lock their car doors because otherwise they'd come out in the morning and there'd be bags of zucchini in the front seat uh, from the neighbors. So we're going to go over some things here in which you can do with this zucchini that you may not be aware of that you can utilize it and actually use everything that you've got and what people are willing to give you. So uh, what are some things here in which we can do to the zucchini? So one thing you can do that is a little bit I, don't, I guess you could say different, is zucchini relish. Many people, when they think of relish, they think of cucumber relish. and But we made zucchini relish. We made it for a few years. I actually, I won um, at the State Fair with that recipe something as well. So We don't, um, we don't do cucumber relish. No. We simply do zucchini relish because I think it is a much better flavor. And you can take those, zucchini, or those cucumbers and make pickles out of them. And uh, no matter what size zucchini you have, you can make if, relish. If you have a ginormous zucchini, ten- generally... You don't want to eat a lot of that. I mean, it's good. It's fine. But it does have kind of more, some people think of a woodier taste. Stringier, woodier. Yeah. yeah. So if you got, you know, all of a sudden you find the zucchini that's been hiding under the leaves, you can make relish out of it. And I brought some to work this past week. We had a little potluck. And people were like, that's really good relish. And I said, you know, it's made with zucchini. <gasps> no way. So, you know, impre- impress your friends and family, I guess. Uh, banana with, bread? Yeah. Or banana, uh, zucchini uh, bread. bread, bread. Um, people um, think it, it'll be, you know. That's one. Yeah, that's another one. I've even heard people sneak it into brownies for their kids. Now, I'm a brownie purist. I wouldn't call those brownies. Maybe you could call them, like, chocolate zucchini bars or something. But that is an idea. There's lots of recipes online for different things that you can vegetables and things you can add into other things so that you have um use of them but yeah the uh, the pie the the um zucchini bread people will uh, swear that it's banana bread mm-hmm. uh no that they don't they have no idea so that's another way you can sneak it in now we've never done this with the pie the zucchini pie now what we were told by a, an a, a, an older Lady, and usually people who are older are much wiser than and we are. And I think are. she learned it from the Amish, right? Well, I, I don't, I don't know that. I don't I, know either. I can't, I'm pretty sure that's what she said. But anyway, zucchini pie instead of apple pie. So what you do is you would peel the zucchini. You do everything you, would, you normally would with an apple. You pie. You would seed it. Yeah. And you have the same amount of zucchini versus apples, and I think you, you cook it down a little bit, perhaps like you would with an apple pie. And then you bake it like an apple pie, and you flavor it with cinnamon and sugar and all that. And people say that they don't know the difference. So if you, you know, they've got a lot of zucchini, you can make zucchini pie and say it's apple pie, and nobody will know the Bring difference. Bring it to work. Yeah, <laughs> uh, that'll be another thing that you can do uh, to to hide that. Now, obviously, you can uh, just fry this up, pan fry it, um, cut the zucchini uh, in, in slivers. And Joey makes a really delicious stuffed zucchini. Yeah, we'll get to that. I want to talk oh, okay. about the. I grew up on fried zucchini, which means you cut the zucchini in, in quarter inch slices, dices, or chips, uh, bre- uh, butter, or uh, uh, coat it in egg, roll it in cornbread, and then fry it in the pan. Cornmeal. Cornmeal, yeah, and fry it in the, in the skillet and until it got brown on both sides, and we ate it that way. Now, Holly, you do not like that whatsoever. No, I don't really like cornmeal. That's the problem. Okay, so, so it's not the we, zucchini, it's the cornmeal. No, corn. so maybe if we fry it in something else. So I had to get to you on the radio show in order to find out the root cause of why you don't like fried zucchini. I don't think you ever asked. Oh, okay. Um, so that, that's one way. Maybe many of you, that's the way you grew up, and that's the way you, proceed, uh, you, you process your zucchini. You fry it in the pan. Now, the stuffed zucchini, you slice it down the center long ways. You seed it so you have little, basically little canoes of zucchini, and then you can stuff it with uh, sausage, cheese, peppers, uh, uh, other vegetables, and you grill that, or you put it in the oven for, uh, I forget, 30 minutes or whatever, and then it's just this giant log of, of goodness of um, all your flavors and seasonings and fruits and, uh, and uh, inside that zucchini half half log, and you know based on the size of your zucchini, you again don't want the baseball size. You want a good you know eight, nine, twelve inch zucchini, so you have plenty of of meat there or, or, or fruit or a vegetable in that that you can bake down and actually have you know if something to put it in. Because if you just have a little four inch zucchini, you don't have no 
place to put your sausages, your peppers, and all that seasoning. So stuffed zucchini, that's another way to go about doing it. If you have a, a lot, um, you can donate to a local food bank. This is something you may want to you want to find out ahead, ahead of time, but they get a lot of non-perishable items. Um, they would probably appreciate some produce. Some people will even plant an extra row for the food bank, things like that, so that is an idea as well. Or if you, or just, if, you know somebody who lives, uh, that used to garden that doesn't garden anymore, uh, you know these people, and when you bring them fresh produce, even if it's just a little bit, they, they, it reminds them of days gone by. Right. Um, so that's another thing. Let's talk about uh, the, the canning. The, well, okay. zucchini noodles, okay. or they're also known as zoodles. Um, so this is a, a new, somewhat it, newer thing. This is thing. a vegan, vegetarian type of dish. Not necessarily. I mean, it, it's it, low carb. Low carb, okay. Mm-hmm. You, but can you're put, s- you can put meat on oh. it. That's fine. You can put meat on anything. But what but you're doing is you're substituting you, the noodles. Yes, and so it's low carb. For the zucchini spirals. You can cook those noodles or you can eat them raw. H- how do you make the noodles, uh, the, the zucchini into buy, the noodles? You can buy a fancy, like, spiralizer tool, or you can just take your vegetable peeler and keep peeling until there's no more zucchini left, and then you have more. It's not necessarily noodles, but it's kind of noodly, so that's an option. You, and you cook it down until it gets, or do you eat it raw? Some people eat it raw, some people cook it. And they put spaghetti sauce or whatever the case is on it? or how Whatever you want. Okay. Mm-hmm. So that's another way uh, to, to make zucchini noodles. Or zoodles. Zoodles. And you can also um, you can also pickle the zucchini, which we did. We did that, and, and I think it got really mushy. They were good, but I think that if they if you did refrigerator pickles, that would be better. Well, also we did like twelve quarts, and we <laughs> didn't know if we liked them or not. And this was like six years ago, and we found out we didn't like them. And we had six, seven, eight quart. You know, tw- we had a lot of pickles that uh, we didn't enjoy eating. So uh, another thing. Now, what we do enjoy eating that we canned is mock zucchini. Oh yeah, let's mock, talk about so that. It's mock pineapple. Mo- okay, so mock pineapple. You make. You peel the zucchini, you seed it, and then you chop it up into squares. Cubes. Could, or cubes. Thank you. Um, you, could, you could possibly, I'm sure, do like, um, what's it called? Like circles. Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, so that's what we did. And you, you cook it with a little bit of pineapple juice and some sugar, and it's delicious. It tastes just like pineapple. Uh, yeah, and you can it, and you would never, ever guess that it was uh Zucchini, right? Because you've infused that pineapple juice into the zucchini itself, and it, it's just phenomenal. And that's what you can do with all your extra zucchini is um, turn into pineapple mock pineapple. So, uh, is, is there anything else we need to cover? That that's a short list of a bunch of things in which you can do with zucchini that you probably didn't know you could do with zucchini and the shelf life on a zucchini if you harvest it today you've got two three weeks before it uh, needs to be processed but obviously the sooner you eat it process it the better it is for you well when it comes to mowing grass we want to have a good lawn a good looking lawn and maybe you don't have the equipment in which you can make that lawn look beautiful Aaron's can help you out with that that's be- do you hear that? That's your neighbor shaking in their grass-stained shoes. Aaron's is about to help you step up your grass-cutting game. Your name is on the mailbox, so the Aaron's name should be on your mower. Heavy-duty steel construction, smarter, smoother controls, professional cutting performance. The only thing we love more than the smell of freshly cut grass is a sweet taste of victory. Aaron's, it comes down to this. Visit Aaron's.com to find your local dealer for lawn and snow removal equipment. When we come back, Jessica Walliser will be with us. She's the co-host of The Organic Gardener on KDK Radio in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and she's a horticultural expert right after this. Tweet Joey and Holly using hashtag TWVG. Oh, yeah. What you say? You say Nasala Kombucha. It'll put some glide in your stride and some pep in your step. Nasala Kombucha. <laughs> yeah. Nasala Kombucha makes your body Mycorrhizae is a beneficial fungus from PlantSuccess.com that will greatly increase your plant's germination, ability, and a healthier root structure. You can increase seed sprouting, root growth, and general plant germination. Mycorrhizae can be used with hydroponics, root cutting, seed sprouting, coca core, and soil. PlantSuccess.com carries powder, granule, and tablet forms of 
mycorrhizae. Increase the level of mycorrhizae in your soil for your plants to give them the optimal opportunity to produce an incredible harvest. For more information and to purchase, visit plantsuccess.com. Garden seeds do not have to cost a fortune. Just 99 cents at migardener.com. With over 300 varieties of non-GMO, heirloom and organic, flower, vegetable, and herb seeds available year-round, pay less and get more seeds. Shipping as low as $2.50. That just makes sense. Go to migardener.com for seeds and gardening needs, tools, and special blend fertilizer. migardener.com. It's that simple. Family owned and operated. Do you have a problem with deer or small herbivores eating your vegetation? There is a natural solution that is safe for your pets and family. Bobex is the answer. An environmentally friendly solution to protect your plants will not wash off and is guaranteed. Bobex deer was independently tested against nine known competitors and rated 93% effective, second only to a physical barrier. Bobex can be used on all types of ornamentals, trees, and shrubs. Ask for it by name at your local independent garden center. Find out more visit bobex.com b-o-b-b-e-x dot c-o-m now back to the wisconsin vegetable garden radio show with your hosts joey and holly baird it is the wisconsin vegetable gardener radio show on the wisconsin uh on wnov 860 am and w293 cx 106.5 the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener.com, your destination, 950, 960 plus videos, Instagram, Twitter, and a whole, Facebook, and a whole lot more. Well, when it comes to the official garden center of the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show, it's Blue Mel's. And maybe you don't want to cut your grass, and maybe you're tired of cutting your grass. Blue Mel's can do it for you. I mean, you have to pay them. It's, it's not like a free thing. <laughs> But uh, you can have them come out. They'll do a free consultation on your property. They'll come out weekly to beautify your property so you can sell that lawnmower, buy a barbecue grill, and not have to worry about cutting your grass. They'll do it for you. And if you want to see what Blue Mills has available at their store, uh, their location, they've still got native plants. They've got decorative items for your property, mulch, sand, compost, and coffee shop, playground, and a whole lot more. And there. knowledgeable staff. Uh, most of them are master gardeners, and they know their stuff. It's, they they know what they're talking about. And where can and we they've f- been around since 1955. You can find them at 4930 West Loomis Road in Greenfield. So that's just south of Layton. And they are at 414-282-4220, or you can go to bluemels.com. There you go. So let's go to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Holly, to bring in our next guest. Jessica Walliser co-hosts the Organic Gardeners on KDK Radio in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. She's a regular contributor to Fine Garden, Urban Farm, and Hobby Farm magazines. She also serves on the editorial advisory board of the American Horticultural Society. And she's also an author and devoted bug lover. Welcome to the program, Jessica. Thanks so much, Joey and Holly. How are you guys today? We are well. Thank you for taking time out of your day to join us on the program. Now, for people who are wanting to, uh, if that sounds familiar pittsburgh uh your co-host doug oster was on about show 13 ish 14 somewhere in there a couple months ago and uh, that's where the familiarity to some of our listeners may come from excellent i heard he had a very good time so i'm sure i'll have the same uh, well we tried to figure out if he was above or below or across from us uh, but uh, i think we just got that uh, figured out <laughs> Uh, let, let's start with this. You are a horticulturist. For those who have no idea what that is, uh, what is a horticulturist and what, uh, what is the difference between that and a master gardener? Ah, that's a very good question. So a horticulturist is someone who has essentially a, usually a four-year degree, uh, a bachelor's degree in horticulture. Um, so, for example, I went to Penn State University for horticulture. I learned about everything from plant pathology and taxonomy and nutrition to, uh, you know, soil science and entomology. Uh, so it's a four-year degree, just like a teaching degree or something like that, whereas a master gardener is a volunteer in training program. So uh, the master gardener is usually done through the state extension service in whatever state you live in, and you go through a training program. Uh, that usually lasts uh, several months, where you learn sort of a little, little bit about everything uh, about gardening. So someone like me teaches a master gardener. So that's sort of the difference between the two of them. Okay. So you, you're the teacher. You went through the educational process, and, and master gardeners are people who are just normal individuals who want to be given that title after they achieve a certain criteria. 
Absolutely. And master gardeners are essential for so many gardening programs, you know, school gardens, um, educational workshops and programs, educating the community uh, about smart gardening practices. Master gardeners are absolutely essential for that. Um, and and it, there's a wonderful volunteer base, especially here in western Pennsylvania, uh, and they do very, very good work. Fantastic. Now, some people may see a lot of ants in their garden, and maybe they are not sure what's going on there. Is that a good or a bad thing? Is it beneficial or harmful? Well, it's interesting that you should, uh, you know, bring up ants and especially insects in general because though I am a trained horticulturist, I'm also an amateur entomologist. And my focus really over the last couple of years has switched from promoting, you know, plants in the garden and, and doing everything revolving around plants. And instead, it has shifted to really promoting the other creatures that share our gardens with us, including lots of insects and ants is on that list. So, you know, putting them in that category of whether they're good or bad is essentially categorizing them for us humans. Um, in the garden, they do not cause damage. Um, sometimes they may get after seedlings or eat a few seeds here and there um, as you plant them, but in general, they're considered to be very beneficial to the garden, uh, with the exception, of course, of fire ants, which uh, are an invasive species. I, I don't think they've made it to Wisconsin yet, and I don't think they ever will, but uh, they can really be harmful to gardeners, obviously, because they bite. But in general, in a garden, ants are considered to be very good things. Well, let's talk about good bugs. What is the most misunderstood good bug in your garden that everyone thinks is a bad bug? Oh, my gosh, the most misunderstood. Well, um, there's a lot of misunderstood bugs in general, I think. Uh, you know, people, they all have that ick factor, so people kind of freak out when they see a bug in the garden. But it's actually less than 1% of the uh, million or so identified insect species on the planet that are classified as agriculture or human pests. So it's a very small number that are considered to be pests. Um, but I would say of all of the good bugs, like the ladybugs and the lace wings that live out in the garden, probably the most misunderstood are the paper wasps, which uh, some people will call yellow jackets or hornets or a different type of them. They make for that big, papery nest either up in a tree or down under the ground. And in general, people see them as being wicked uh, because in the fall they can grow pretty aggressive. But the reality is that a single nest of those guys can eat tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of pests out of your garden. I watch them every day taking the cabbage worms off my cabbage plants and flying them back to their nest to feed the young. So if you come across one of those nests in your yard or garden, try to give it a wide berth, you know, cordon it off with some caution tape. Don't destroy it. Those nests are only used for one year, and then they're abandoned in the fall. Uh, the only one that survives the fall is the fertilized queen. So, um, you know, they're, they're in general, although we think of them as being really bad, they're really, really incredibly good for the garden. Right, and most times if you don't bother them, they won't bother you. Uh, but if you start poking around, they're going to come after you. Right, yeah. right. If you're going to throw rocks at it or something like that, that's really bad news. Now, obviously, you know, if the nest is where your kids are playing or it's right by your front door, then you're want to, you know, going to want to take some type of control measures. But if it's not way up in a tree or way out at the back of your property, just leave it be. Um, as I said, they're really, really good for the garden. Well, another insect that eats a lot of bad bugs are ladybugs, and one of their big buffet items is aphids, and they can go through what a couple of dozen or maybe a hundred of aphids a day. Uh, absolutely, and a lot of people are surprised to hear that uh, we have about 450 different species of ladybugs here in North America, and there's a lot of them that are not red with black spots. You know, they're all different colors. Some of them have stripes. Some of them have no spots at all. Uh, one of my favorite species is called the ashy gray, and it's a beautiful gray ladybug with black spots, but it's arboreal. It spends its whole life up in the trees, so you know, unless you're an arborist or a monkey, you're never going to see that uh, species most of your whole life. So um, it, it's important to learn the role that they play and give them a chance to do their work in your garden because they really do control a very broad diversity of pests. And that's what we keep preaching on our program, our videos, our website, and you and Doug as well. If you decide to spray a chemical on your property to control what you believe is a bad bug, that that chemical is not, uh, it will kill all the bad bugs. It doesn't just go, oh, well, I'm only supposed to kill X bug. I'll not affect anything else. Absolutely. And there was, that's what I like to call collateral damage. There's a lot of collateral damage. And people think sometimes even, 
why won't I just spray, you know, horticultural oil or insecticidal soap? That's going to be better. You know, that's going to be better than a, than a chemical pesticide because, you know, it's, it's labeled as organic. And though, yes, it is better certainly for the safety of the human user, it may not necessarily be better for all of the good insects. So if we think about, you know, it's labeled as safe for use around beneficials. What they test it on are like the adults. So they will test it on an adult ladybug. They won't test it on the soft-bodied larva or on the eggs of those ladybugs. So while it says it's safe for use on beneficials, it's only on the adult beneficials. So in my garden, I haven't sprayed anything in almost, well, gosh, we've lived here now 12 years. So in about 12 years, uh, organic or otherwise, I haven't sprayed. I have a really good balance between beneficial insects and the bad guys, so they keep each other in check. Now, as we're getting to the hottest part of the summer, when you read online, it'll say, like, this plant needs this amount of water per week. How do you judge that, or is that just a garden myth? Ah, that's a really great question. So, you know, yeah, we, we can put these guidelines, and I think, you know, we as, as humans and as gardeners sort of, we need to know the rules, right? We need to know how much do I water this, how often, and how much do I put on it. But you and I know, right, as experienced gardeners, that there's a lot of wiggle room in that, that some plants are certainly more drought-resistant than others, that it depends on how much rain you get, how, uh, you know, dense your soil is, how well will the water percolate down into the plant's roots. So we learn to sort of play it by ear, right, when we water our plants. We know what cues to look for from the plants that let us know that it's time to water them. We want to water, obviously, just before drought stress occurs. We want to try to catch them before they wilt, if at all possible. Um, Sometimes it's a matter of just sticking your finger down into the soil and seeing how much moisture it needs. Uh, But you can definitely pay attention to the drought resistance of plants, so something like a succulent isn't going to need to be irrigated nearly as much as something like a tomato, which requires a lot more moisture. So you kind of learn to wing it eventually. (laughs) Right, and and just like it's a a guideline. If the seed packet says plant at a half inch deep, if you get a quarter inch deep or three quarters or an inch deep, that sucker is going to grow no matter what. It's just a guideline. You would kind of want to follow, but it's not scientific proof, oh, I'm too deep, it's not going to grow. Right, exactly. I mean, there are some times, you know, obviously if you don't water at all or you don't bury the seed and it's one that requires darkness for germination, you know, that can obviously influence those things as well. But I mean, gardening is really, it's a flexible, flexible hobby. So you don't have to do everything 100% right all the time. Well, I want to bring up this question since you're a horticulturist. What is the purpose of topping or uh, stubbing cutting uh, of trees uh, in people's front yards they they basically knock all the the limbs off and there's just it's just just giant hat rack basically in the front yard just a bunch of stalks and limbs why do people do this and this is one of the worst things you can do for a tree and if people don't know what i'm talking about go to your favorite search engine and type in topping trees and you'll see exactly what i'm talking about yeah i think it's a holdover from the 70s to be honest with you i mean in the 1970s Driving through my neighborhood as a kid, everybody topped their trees because, uh, you know, some dude with his name slapped on the side of a truck, you know, Joe the tree guy, said, oh, your tree's getting too big, it's going to fall on your house, so I'm going to take some of this weight off by, you know, topping the tree. But really what that practice does is it generates uh, weak growth, water sprouts, uh, it is an entry route for fungal diseases and pathogens, and that's what makes it one of the worst practices. I mean, a tree, just like people, you're genetically, it's genetically determined how high you're supposed to grow, right? How tall you're going to get. So with a tree, if you're talking about a tree that's supposed to get 60 feet tall and you prune it, it's going to have a lot of negative consequences to that when you go ahead and, and top that tree right away. So be smart about what trees you're planting. Make sure you pick ones that are only going to grow to the height that you want them to grow. Uh, and the practice really needs to be stopped. I mean, it's just an old-fashioned gardening practice. But, I mean, it's time is over. People do not need to do this anymore. Well, and if you're going to decide to purchase a tree, there is a tag on it that says this tree will grow average of 10 foot a year and total of 80 foot in X amount of years. If you're looking, there, there, you've got to know what you want before you go into it. If you're going to buy a tree to plant, you just don't want to grab something that's on sale, put it in the ground, and then have to deal with the consequences six years down the road. Absolutely. It's like you're not going to send your child to a daycare without, you know, researching that daycare first, right, to find out if it's the right fit for your child. Same thing. You know, is this tree the right fit for your yard? Is it going to 
you know, reach the height and the girth that you want and not get so far out of bounds. I would recommend a fruit-bearing tree so you have something of return and investment, but that's just my personal uh, uh, professional uh, thought on that. Now, I agree. I love that. And flowers. Flowers aren't bad either. Right. <laughs> Definitely. Where, now, where can people find you and your books? Yeah. So uh, pretty much the, the easiest place to get me is my website, which is just my name, Jessica Walliser. It's W-A-L-L-I-S-E-R at um, uh JessicaWalzer.com is what it is. I must have gave you my email address. Uh, <laughs> JessicaWalzer.com, and on there you can contact me via email through that website, and you can learn more about my books. Uh, I have several out. Probably the two most popular ones are Good Bug, Bad Bug, which is a nice little field guide for identifying insects in the garden, and then Attracting Beneficial Bugs to Your Garden, which is all about luring in those beneficial insects to help you control pests. Uh, real quickly, what is one of your tips on bringing in those beneficial insects uh, to make your garden happier and healthier? Excellent. Uh, good. Well, aside from eliminating the use of pesticides in the garden, it's also creating habitat and making that habitat year-round. Uh, we gardeners tend to want to put our gardens to bed neat and tidy at the end of the season and cut everything down and rake it all out. And that basically takes away overwintering sites for all of our native pollinators and many of these species of pest-eating beneficial insects. So leave those gardens stand through the winter, do your cleanup in the mid to late spring of the following year, and you'll naturally boost your populations of those beneficial insects. Well, Jessica, we greatly appreciate you taking time out of your day to join us, sharing some of your gardening wisdom with Holly, myself, and all of our listeners. Thank you, Jessica. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. And we'll be right back after this with your garden questions and our garden answers. Have a gardening question? You can call into the ivorganic.com hotline at 414-444-5250 right now. Eating natural and organic is not as expensive as it used to be, especially when you shop at Whitman. They have aisles full of certified organic food, from fruits and vegetables to dairy products and even meat, all at great prices. They even have a huge selection of wheat-free and gluten-free items. I can come to Woodman's and get everything I need all under one roof. My name is Alicia, and I shop at Woodman. Pat Chen Mill, 125 years of experience producing stone, ground, organic flour, and cornmeal made from premium quality whole grains. Family-owned company, continual standards that are non-GMO, organic at the highest safety levels, offering a wide variety of flours, pasta, baking mixes, flaxseed, and more, even kosher and gluten-free options. Found at most local grocers like Woodman's. For more information and recipes, visit HotShenMill.com. That's H-O-D-G-S-O-N-M-I-L-L.com. The number one key to healthy, productive plants are the roots. Starting from seed to full-grown plants, RootMaker.com has the answer. From seed starting trays with an innovative design that air prunes the roots, creating a fabulous root system, never again will you have root-bound plants, to multiple-gallon grow bag sizes to raise beds. RootMaker.com has your grow needs covered. Visit RootMaker.com. I want a garden center that listens to and understands my needs. I want to buy my gardening products from a local business with strong ties to the community. All I want is a garden center that truly values their customers. It seems like everyone is selling plants these days, but I'm having a hard time finding quality. I take pride in my garden, so I want my garden center to take pride in their products. Where will you be going for all of your gardening needs this season? Blue Mel's Garden Center. We are your answer. Blue Mel's 4930 West Loomis Road, 414-282-4220. Here's two gardeners that understand common sense. How effective is that, really? Well, that's about as effective as a screen door on a submarine. Joey and Holly Baird. It's the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show on 860 AM, WNOV, and W293CX 106.5, the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com, your destination for all things gardening. 965 plus videos, digital magazines, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and a whole lot more. Uh, let's go to the IVOrganics.com hotline. We have a caller with a question. What is your question? My question is, uh, we used to find those heirloom seeds uh, for ve- garden, vegetable gardening over on Forest Home, but they since went out of business. 
is there any way or anywhere you can guide us to find those heirloom seeds for corn, strawberries, squash? You know, um, it, it, they're so rare to find. Is there any any leads that you might have? Uh, any air, to find good heirloom seeds? Uh, yeah, good quality ones, not from junk. Somebody, you know, says that they'll come back, but they never do. Right. Uh, are you looking for local, or are you able to order online? Well, we'll have to do whatever. We're, we're, okay. we're looking for the best quality, and it's probably going to cost the best money. Okay. Uh, MIGardener.com is, uh, they do have some left from 2000, for 2017. They restock their over 350 varieties of heirloom uh, seeds in November. Um, he has told us that we can mention another company if uh, he doesn't have those available, which is rareseeds.com. Uh, so they are quality. They do come back. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. They're good. you're looking for you're looking for seeds, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, M I Gardener, like Michigan M I Gardener dot com, and then Rare Seeds R A R E Seeds dot com are two really good ones for all those heirloom varieties. Now, where are they actually located? Um, M I Gardener is in Michigan. He's on the uh, east side of Michigan, no, uh, north okay. of Detroit, and then Rare Seeds is out of um, southern Mi- Missouri. Mis- yeah, southern Missouri. So those are uh, two of them there. Okay. And they're both okay. family owned. Um, okay. They're all both smaller companies. Okay, so M I Gardening. Yeah. Am I Gardener? Uh, if you go to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener dot com website, uh, you will see that on the main page on the right hand side. Um, okay. Yeah. And they got any any seeds that we want uh, uh, heirloom seeds. Correct. Yes. Right N- now, there's not going to be as many seeds this year. But if you start looking, I think they put seeds out usually in November or December, and then you can find more at that time. Right, and then at the, at that point, if they're cultivated right, then we don't have to go back no more. We just use them as God gave them to us, right? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, you can save those, and and, and the, some of them. Yep. Absolutely. Right, the old way. The, the old way, uh, the, the, the traditional way. The traditional way, correct. Right. Okay, thank you, sir. Appreciate thank you for listening. Thank you for your question. If you have a question on the IVOrganics.com, you can call into the IVOrganics.com hotline. If you have a question, IVOrganics.com is what, Holly? Ivy Organic 3-in-1 Plant Guard naturally protects plants against damaging sunburn, insects, and rodents, protects newly installed plants and trees, shields prune and damaged surfaces. For use on your roses, fruit, and nut trees, ornamental trees, and shrubs, this product is non-toxic, environmentally safe, and organic. You can find more information at IVOrganics.com, or you can call in right now at 414-444-5250. We had a question um, last week, or um, Sunday I think it was, um, can I use tree bark to make compost? You can use tree bark to make compost. Here's what you want to do. You want to make sure that tree bark breaks down completely. You want to add other items to that compost pile that are chemical-free, seed-free, and uh, some of this potting soil that you get or... It'll be bark stuff. You don't. You want to make sure your compost is completely broke down, so you have enough nitrogen and carbon browns to get that to break down correctly. And so carbon is the browns, nitrogen is the greens. Right, and yep. that's what you need for uh, to make your own compost. We have another question on the ivorganics.com hotline caller. What is your question? I have a, a, a burning a burning bush and a shin rose bush. And neither one of them came back this year. Should I cut them down, or what should I do? A okay. Neither one of those came back. Uh, no. It would in the fall was. Did you see any signs of distress to them, or no? It, they was beautiful. Beautiful. Now we have. Uh, how how old would they have been? Do you have um, my burning rose bush is about four years old, and my shin rose is about three. Okay. Well, uh, I don't, I, I'm going to tell you right now, I don't know. I can get you an answer. And if you uh, stay tuned here, we may have an answer to you by the end of the show. Uh, okay. Or first thing next week's show, because I don't want to just make something up and make you feel good for a little bit. I want to get you the actual answer. Right. And, and that's what we will do. Okay. So I appreciate your call. We've got this noted down. Holly's doing some research now with some re- uh, reputable websites that we trust. And uh, if that doesn't pan out, I've got some resources in which I can go to this week and get you the correct answer. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you for your call. Thank you for listening. Sure. Bye-bye. And... Uh,
did you have an answer for that, Holly? Not yet. Okay. Well, let's let's work on some of the questions that I know we have an answer for, and um, I want to get her the correct answer, and I know a couple of resources in which I can go to. Uh, Holly, how about this question here with uh, canning lids? I'm, I'm, uh, let's see, where is it? Oh, yeah, here it is. Uh, I, I use the two piece canning lids, the metal rings, the metal lids, but I've also seen that there is such a thing as reusable lids, plastic lids, and a rubber gasket that I have to purchase over the, the rubber gasket I have to repurchase. Are these any good? Do you recommend them? People like them. Um, I know that they, you know, if you want to go that route, that's fine. You do have to purchase the gasket still. The plastic, the plastic lid is, you can yeah, reuse. You can okay. reuse the plastic lid, but you have to purchase the gasket. You can use your regular rings, but you would just, um, I haven't really heard anything bad. Some Somebody did say that you sometimes getting the seal can be tricky. It's not a bad idea. It's definitely a good idea to do the reusable. It's not completely reusable, again, with the gasket. Um, if you want to, it doesn't hurt to try it if you want to try. Like if I were to try it, I would try some pickles or something, something that I could stick in the refrigerator um, if it didn't seal correctly. Now, would you recommend if you're doing a batch of eight quarts that you'd maybe only do two or three with these new lids until you understood how yeah. they, okay. Definitely. But the directions are on there, and I've always heard mostly good things. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Uh, question number two that came in about tomato pruning, which is a problem that some people are dealing with the late, the, the early blight that they've got on their plants. Yeah, so can I over prune my cherry tomato plant? I transplanted it into the garden late May, and now it's almost three and a half feet tall. I do have about 30 plus buds with four tomatoes growing. I kind of trimmed it a lot of the leafy greens off. Uh, should I continue to prune it? Uh, well, if, if you've already felt that you've gone too far, stop. Uh, what you're wanting to do is you want to remove the foliage, the leaves, from the ground to about six to eight inches above the ground in order to prevent a lot of the soil splash up. Even if you have good mulch, the soil spores of early blight can still splash, splash up on the leaves. You can over prune it. A lot of these plants, even if you over prune, they will fight back. They're going to go in a stress recovery mode, but they but will come back. You don't want to prune more than 25%. Right. Um, so, if, you know, it's hard to gauge type of that type of thing. But, uh, 25 percent we've had them where we put them out too early for example of how hardy or how strong plants plants want to live so we've put them out too early they've gotten shocked they've dropped all their leaves so they're just green stalks and within two weeks they started regenerating leaf growth but also it put the production of that plant back several weeks because it went through i got to put leaves on before i can worry about reproductive uh, fruit production so uh, you can over prune it but 25 percent like holly said is a good gauge in which you can stop uh, pruning and uh, get a re- get rid of all those dead and bad looking leaves. So real quick, I have discoloration on many of my container plants. What is wrong? Well, if the container plants are outside, we've had a lot of rain recently. A lot of those nutrients are going to get flushed out quickly uh, out of the the soil. So you may want to give it a, a fertilizer boost if it's indoors. Think about how long that plant may have been in that soil. You may have to repot it. Uh, liquid, synthetic, granular, um, fertilizer, organic, it doesn't matter. You just want to follow the recommended, ratio, recommended rate on the back of the package. That's why they're there. Just because a little is good does not mean a lot is better. And, uh, you will get, and if there, you have discoloration on those leaves, you can trim those off. Again, whether it's zucchini, eggplant, uh, peppers, whatever, up to 25%. You just don't want to go crazy and mower all the way down to the bottom of the plant. Well, this show is brought to you by great companies that make this show possible. They pay the bills, so we are here every Saturday morning to share your, to share our knowledge with you and to answer your gardening questions just like... Nassala Kombucha is the executive sponsor of the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. Nassala is made in Wisconsin with local tea and natural herbs. Look for it in the fridge or aisle at your local grocer. If you don't see it, ask for it because if it's not Nassala Kombucha, it's not kombucha. For more information, visit nassala.com. Programming note, join us next week where we're going to talk all about essential oils. What are they used for in the house? What are they used for in the garden? Amanda from Freedom Acres gave us a little tease last week on the program, as well as dealing with powdery mildew. One, what is it? And two, what do you need to do to combat it, slow it down, or even stop it? As well as our guest from UWM Extension right here in Milwaukee County, Sharon Morris. Uh, She also can be seen weekly on Fox 6. She's their gardener as well as she's a horticultural educator uh, for Milwaukee County. 
miss any portion of this show or want to revisit it in its entirety, you can find that under the radio tab at the website, the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com, for full-length in-studio video and podcast replay. Looking for a specific topic or individual interview? Find that on the highlight tab on the right-hand side of the main page at the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener. Dot com. Until next week, for Holly Baird, I'm Joy Baird, and we will see you in the garden.